Hi, everybody. Um, Corey here. It's been a minute. Uh, I realized that it's been mm, several months since I posted anything on the channel that's just kind of me talking, uh, chatting with you. I have been working on in terms of video projects, just haven't gotten them uploaded yet. Um, but um, that's coming down the way. Uh, I am sorry for being away. Uh, I really enjoy kind of having these moments to do these sort of video chats and, and interact with folks. Um, through our YouTube channel. So um, joining you here today, slightly different kind of backdrop. This is my office area, um, just kind of a different view of it. Yes, I have a Bill, Bill Cipher and, uh, and one of the um, Squid Game uh, dolls back there that we do crazy Halloween stuff. So I, uh, these are things I've made for Halloween. Uh, so what's the point of the video today? Um, well, today uh, I wanted to talk about a couple of things uh, that have to do with um, my book, New World Witchery. Uh, I know that seems a little self-serving, but there's a, a, I promise you there's kind of a good reason uh, for, for me to kind of get into this. Shouldn't have the little stickers on here, should I? Um, but there it is, <clears throat> New World Witchery. Um, so why am I talking about this book? Because the book is a little over a year old. I had originally intended to do a one year anniversary video for the book um, where I talked kind of about how the book had done over the first year, kind of what audience it had reached, um, things like that. Um, but I just didn't get around to it in April. I had even, I'd even contacted the Wellen to get some of the sales numbers and stuff like that, had all that information, just had kind of a chaotic April and May. Uh, and so I just didn't get a chance to come in and provide any uh, of that. So I'm doing it now um, because it's another one year anniversary in the fact that it's my birthday. Uh, so uh, today I'm uh, taking the chance to talk a little bit about, since this is my uh, solar return, talking about the solar return of the book as well. Since we're, we're intricately linked, we're tied together in strange ways, right? So I want to talk a little bit about this book, kind of what it's done over the past year, and then talk a little bit as well about why I write about witchcraft at all, uh, kind of get into that a little bit too. Basically, uh, I'll give you kind of a breakdown of uh, the technical stuff with the book, the sales figure, stuff like that. Um, it's done really, really well uh, overall. Um, so for example, uh, the figures from the well and back in April, uh, really uh, as of April 8th, 2022, which is the one year anniversary of the book, um, it had sold, sold 7,717 total sales, which is kind of a fun little uh, number there. Um, so 7,717 total books it sold, uh, as well as 655 ebooks. Um, and th those who are watching this may be thinking like, well, that sounds like a really low number. Um, but for a niche book in a nonfiction market, um, that's remarkably good. Doing over two to 3,000 sales in your first year is considered pretty good uh, for a small small press publication like this. Uh, most of those copies have been sold through the, the giant conglomerate power of Amazon, uh, just because that's where people find books. And I understand that. Um, a lot of them also were sold through Books A Million, about a thousand copies were sold that way. Um, I was really impressed. Uh, almost a thousand copies were sold through um, uh, witchy shops, uh, which I think is wonderful. I would love to hear uh, if you're interested in sharing this. If you picked up a copy of the book from your local witchy shop, I want to know like what witchy shop did you get it from? Um, I'd love to kind of share that and share around some of the, the places that are um, that are carrying the book um, just as a kind of way to sort of like uh, let people know where to find this. Um, and then there's just other independent bookstores that are not specifically magically oriented. Um, those also uh, have sold quite a few copies uh, in the couple of hundred range, uh, which again is big for the fact that there are not a ton of independent bookstores out there um, anymore. Um, and ones that sell kind of witchy stuff as well. It's it's a small piece of the market, but um, I appreciate that we're there, that we're a part of that. Again, the book has done pretty well. It's, in, it's technically its fourth printing, which means it's gone through three full editions, and now it is in a fourth edition, which means they've had to order it um, three additional times beyond the sort of initial run of books, which is a good sign. It means that it's done uh, better than they expected it to do kind of at its initial run, which um, means that they are very encouraged by that. They're very happy with kind of the work that has come out of the book. Um, the publisher is very, very you know, glad that this is a part of their catalog. Um, and I'm happy because it means that people are getting the book and getting a chance to read it. Um, in terms of other editions of the book, there is actually one foreign language translation so far, which is Russian of all things. Uh, that sort of surprised me, but uh, I'm thrilled. I love that, that it's been translated into, into Russian as well. Um, I'm hoping eventually somebody will pick it up and translate it. Um, I think uh, Spanish and French would be two editions that I would imagine that it will eventually find. Um, but who knows? We never know uh, how these things are going to work out. So um, I don't have any control over it. I can't actually uh, 
tell somebody to go publish it as a as a Spanish translation or anything like that. So um, if you have a favorite Spanish language publisher of New Age or metaphysical or magical books, you could reach out to them and say, hey, uh, have you thought about trying to get this book um, and see if they'll, they'll do the translation for you? So yeah, so that's kind of where we are with that. Um, I've had a really good year in some other ways on this book too, in terms of the, the technical side of it. Like I said, those are kind of the sales numbers. But there's some other factors that kind of go into the, the Amazon sales rankings because Amazon is, for better or worse, one of the primary indicators of how well books are doing and it sort of tracks these sales. Um, th this book is not going to be the kind that hits the New York Times bestseller list. So it's unlikely that I'll, I'll show up on a list like that. So I have to kind of work off of um, the information I get from analytics in Amazon. And in this case, uh, the things that I really pay attention to are overall sales ranking and then kind of individual categorical sales. And one of the things I thought was really wonderful was when the book came out, um, it was very, very quickly um, number one in fields like um, uh, witchcraft and witchcraft studies. Uh, and I think it eventually was number one or number three in folklore and mythology studies as well um, in their categories, which is wonderful. That's a really, really good place to be. Um, and it only, those rotate um, really um, every couple of hours. Um, so it really was only in those positions for a couple of, you know, a couple of hours to a couple of days, depending on kind of the category. Um, but it did really, really well. And the thing that I was really encouraged by was not so much that it hit these kind of peak points, but um, it was in the top 10,000 books for for a while. And then it stayed more or less in the top 50,000 books on Amazon um, for almost a full year, which means that it's doing fairly well. Um, that's the sign that the book is doing fairly well. But the the one that actually impresses me the most, the one that I really, really like, um, it stayed pretty high up in the, the witchcraft um, witchcraft studies category um, in their top 50 to top 100 for, for quite a while. Um, but the one that I was proudest of was the fact that it was in the folklore mythology category. Um, and it's uh, one of, I think, only about 10 books that was in the top a uh, hundred list uh, for folklore and mythology written by um, a living folklorist. Uh, so there's a lot of stuff on there um, in that folklore list that are either sort of anthologies of myth myth collections, um, oftentimes like Bullfinch's mythology or Edith, Hamil Edith Hamilton's mythology, um, uh, or they'll have stuff by Joseph Campbell, um, uh, which um, is a, he's a mythographer uh, in a comparative literature studies person. He's not technically a folklorist, um, but it falls in that category, but again, not alive. Um, but there were only a few, there's only a very small number of living folklorists that wind up in that top 100 because folklore is such a niche category um, that uh, oftentimes collections of folk tales not done by folklorists um, or uh, editions of myths that are done by kind of bigger names. I think like Stephen Fry um, um, had a, a version of some myths that, that was in the top category. So it's very rare for... Um, for these books written by an actual folklorist to hit that top 100 in their own category, right? In their own uh, list. Um, but this one did, this one stayed, stayed kind of in that top 100 for I think about eight to nine months. It was, it was pretty consistently one of the top 100 books in that category. Um, I was immensely proud of that. Uh, I think that was really wonderful. Um, thought I would also share briefly just a couple of um, some of the reviews, there are over 300 reviews at this point on Amazon of the book. Just going to highlight a couple of uh, reviews um, that have shown up that really touched me, really made me feel wonderful. Um, so I appreciate them. Um, so the first one is from uh, reader Donna, who says, over the last year, I've been thinking about what New World Witchery has taught me. I've been noting the everyday luck and charms, the knocking on wood, the annual TV news stories comparing the weather predictions of all the regional groundhogs, the evil eye talisman at the cash register for the Greek diner. I've also been talking to the older relatives, asking about the great aunt who put a knife over her cards when she got up from the card game, or about what my grandmothers used to say about spiders and crickets. I've started a notebook where I jot down the seasonal changes that impact my garden or the best time to harvest the wild plants that I use, along with my tarot spreads and random synchronicities that I take as signs. All of this next to the charm I overheard from the guy at the flea market and the recipe I tried for dinner and the recipe I tried for a salve. I've made trips to the local history section of the library. In short, it jump-started the quest for folk magic around me. If my book did, did nothing but that, nothing but that for Donna and a couple of other people, I would consider it a massive success. That is exactly why I wanted this book out there, um, because I want people to see how much folklore is in their lives, how much folk magic is already interwoven into the existence they have, and then work to enhance that from where they already are, right? This isn't about necessarily going out and finding a system of magic that isn't yours and 
um, you know, learning how to do this random other system of magic. It's instead turning towards the magic that's already around you and using that. And I think that's wonderful. I really appreciate that. So thank you, Donna, for sharing that. Um, next one is by listener Rue. says, this book is a treasure chest of history, magical practices and folklore that any witch or the witchcraft curious should have on their bookshelf. Magic is present and accessible to all of us. And this book shows how you've likely crossed paths with it for years before you knew what it was. Again, I'm very much hitting that point that magic is not is not something you're going to have to go out and um, find from somebody else, but something that is already part of your world and your life. Um, if you just know how to ask the right questions and know, uh, know how to look for it in the world around you, which is hopefully what the book does. Uh, <clears throat> third one, I often found myself skimming like I was studying for a test as opposed to being pulled in by the author. Uh, it would have made a fantastic companion for my anthropology of witchcraft and religion classes in college. The areas of the book that did grab me were the singing bones sections highlighting historical figures and legends in witchcraft. Here's where the author shines, and it feels as though they're next to you telling the stories passed down through the decades uh, from uh, reviewer Donald. Um, and again, I, there's a lot of actually really valid kind of critiques. This was my first main, sort of major book, so uh, I, I actually really like getting um, thoughtful, reasonable, rational critiques uh, you know, about the book and what works and what doesn't work. And Donald had some really good points. This is very, um, it can read like a textbook for some people. Um, so I totally get that. Uh, and I appreciate that comment, Donald. Um, but I also really appreciate that you found these other little pieces in the book. The singing boat sections are ones where I highlight particular people who practiced folk magic uh, in North America at various points in time. So uh, for example, Zora Neale Hurston shows up in there. Um, uh, I get into uh, Mercedes Peña Lane, who's uh, known as the New Moon Carandera. Um, a lot of other people who I kind of point to and say, look, these are stories of magic that are right there um, in your backyard. If you'll just kind of look into your community, you're going to have somebody like this. Um, so I'm thrilled that resonated the way it did. So thank you, Donald, for that. This one is from somebody you probably know, which is Matt Oren. Uh, if you know Matt Oren, um, author of um, Psychic Witchcraft, uh, and he's got a forthcoming book as well. Um, uh, it says, a New World Witchery is a masterful compendium of North America's folklore and folk magic traditions, including an extensive collection of spells, charms, and folk practices from all over the continent. The result is a unique opportunity for American readers to discover and learn about the magical traditions of their regions and that of others. And I love that comment from Matt. Um, one, I was very flattered to get that. Uh, that's not something I necessarily um, expected. Uh, so it was really wonderful to have uh, Matt, who's kind of a fairly big name, spend the time to kind of look at the book and, and respond to it that way. But the thing that I really liked there was talking about looking at your own witchcraft practices, your own folk magical practices as well, um, seeing those, but then also learning about traditions that are not your own. Um, this doesn't necessarily have to be about learning how to do them or learning how to be a member of those other traditions, but just understanding what they are, that they exist out there, um, and maybe picking some, um, some information up um, so that you can be more uh, culturally aware of these other traditions that are already out there, right? Um, being aware of somebody else's culture doesn't necessarily mean that you have to co-opt. It doesn't mean you have to try to stake some sort of ownership over it. It just makes us better people to be able to say, oh, you do this interesting thing. Tell me more about that. Um, that's that's kind of what I hoped for from that. Uh, and the final one I wanted to share, uh, just a brief one from uh, the Heretic Queen. Uh, uh, they wrote, Corey has created an indispensable resource for witches, academics, and everyone in between. The amount of care that went into this work is very evident from the first page to the very last. Um, it was definitely a labor of love and academic rigor. Um, if uh, I'm sure at some point I've shown the photo of me, sort of my stack of books all around me from when I was doing my research for this, it definitely had that kind of labor of love. So thank you for recognizing that. <laughs> it was it was definitely uh, uh, something I, I threw myself into. So I'm glad that that resonated. All of that is to say, I've had, you know, some really wonderful reviews. I had a few very negative reviews. I get the, you know, everybody gets the, the reviews that are sort of the, um, you know, this arrived with a, a dent in the a dent in the box or a scratch on the cover or something like that, which isn't really about the quality of the book so much as the quality of the delivery. That's fine. I've had one or two that are kind of more willful mis misunderstandings of uh, what's in the book itself. One or two that are just kind of like dragging it for the sake of dragging it, which is fine. That happens for everything. I had one um, that raised a point which uh, was basically talking about the idea of um, the the devil in witchcraft uh, it, it sort of they had sort of understood it I was saying like that was a requirement um, when that's not what I intended at all um, but it made me kind of look at it and go oh I probably should have 
made the case that this is just a piece of the folklore and talked about that a little bit more up front. So it gives me something to kind of think about for the future as well. Um, so all of that, you know, of good and bad, those reviews, they all, um, they're all important. They're all valuable. And I really appreciate people taking the time to review the book. That's actually how the book um, gets seen the most is people reviewing it um, and sharing it around to other people. So I'm glad that's finding its audience. Uh, that's very helpful um, and makes me very proud. Thanks as well to everybody who has gotten this book, who has responded to the book as well. I've had lots of interactions on social media, several interactions in real life and in person. Um, all of that um, has been overwhelmingly positive, very, very little negative um, uh, sort of criticism um, with a few valid critical points. And I think that's wonderful. I think that it's great that people are, are able to say like, um, there, there are things that I can do better in the future and that for the most part, people are willing to read this with an open mind and an open heart. Um, I have been so moved um, by the fact that everybody has been so supportive of me and of the book and has been encouraging and sort of saying, you know, we want more, uh, the, you know, we, the, the book club that we did for this with our Patreon, everyone was very, very uh, engaged with that and really wanted to kind of dig into some of the, the stuff that we talked about. Um, there's clearly like a lot of lore that I had to sort of skim over. So people were wanted, wanted to go deeper with that. Um, and I really, I love that. I love that that's kind of um, how people are, are reacting to the book is that this is sparking their own interests. So immense thanks. If you have bought the book, if you've read the book, uh, it's not just about buying it. If you read it through your local library, right? Or if a friend lends it to you, that's great too. I love that. Um, uh, if you're sharing it around with other people, uh, recommending it to them, that's huge. I appreciate it. If you've talked about the book at all online, um, or even with a friend, I've, I've got a few people who are not very much online, but they'll talk to other people. And this is a book that they'll, they'll mention all of that, um, means a lot to me. It's very, very valuable, both for the, in terms of, you know, the, the sort of financial side of the book sales, but it also in terms of the fact that like this book is clearly part of a conversation and I love that. So thank you for that. Um, that gets me into a little bit of kind of the sort of sub thing that I wanted to talk about today, which is why write witchcraft books at all. We're kind of in an information age where a lot of this stuff is available online. Most of what I have done for the past over a decade has been providing a lot of information through things like podcasts and web posts and stuff like that, largely without any kind of book context. Now, obviously I'm drawing from books. I think that that's important. Um, but there's questions all the time about like, well, why publish another witchcraft book? Aren't there already too many witchcraft books out there? Um, people will talk about the idea there's too many witchcraft 101 books. Um, to say one, Thorne Mooney has done a really great um, video post. I believe she did it uh, at her one of her social media accounts. I think it was TikTok where she said, look, there are books that are not 101 out there. There are books that are 201 or, or even beyond that um, that are out there. They're accessible if you seek them out, if you look for them. Um, but the problem is that if you're depending on an algorithm to help you find these books, or if you're depending on what's going to be available kind of on anybody's general bookshelf, it's much harder to find that stuff because um, it gets it gets buried. It's more niche, right? Um, so the stuff that's going to be on bookshelves is the stuff that's going to sell the most, which is oftentimes the 100 level stuff, because that's where a lot of people are first starting, right? That's going to have them the largest audience. And then as you narrow that down, it's going to be more specific. So um Writing witchcraft books, I think, is very, very valuable because it gives us the opportunity to dig deeper on a lot of these particular things. Um, you know, folk magic in general, there are books of folk magic. This is kind of a more overview compendium piece, right? But there have been great books of folk magic that have been published in the past couple of years. Uh, Via Hedera did folk Folkloric American Witchcraft and the Multicultural Experience. Folkloric American Witchcraft, Multicultural Experience by Via Hedera. Um, digs very, very deep into, into the experience of folklore that she has had, as well as some other practices. Uh, so that's been wonderful. Um, Aaron Oberon's Southern Cunning. Uh, they dig into their own history with Southern style conjure practices, um, as well as some stuff that's more specifically rooted to their bioregion. Um, I don't have it right in front of me, but Magia Magia um, uh, digs into brujeria practices um, and uh, American Brujeria by J. Allen Cross uh, does that as well. All of these books are kind of emerging into the market, um, but they're not necessarily ones that you're going to, you know, something like Southern Cunning or um, American Tradition Witchcraft or Magia Magia oftentimes are not going to be the first thing that you're going to see on a bookshelf. Uh, one, because they're published by smaller or more independent presses and two, uh, they're, they're books that are not targeted at a sort of 101 level audience. These books are out there. What really helps to do is to 
start engaging in the conversations around the topics that you're interested in and see what books people are discussing, uh, see what books are coming up in these kind of online um, discussions, and then look at those books and then kind of follow that trail. Look at the, um, look at the bibliographies for some of the books um, that you're interested in and see what books they were drawing from. That's going to give you a lot of direction to go to expand your, your knowledge set. Um, we write these witchcraft books because we really want people to be able to understand a variety of experiences about witchcraft, right? We don't really want it all to be homogenous, 101, the same stuff over and over again, but it, it's very dependent upon the readers to try to find these books uh, in a lot of cases, and the authors um, do our best to put these out there and make them accessible to you. But it, it takes some work to try to track them down sometimes because they're so specialized. The other thing that I really like about writing witchcraft books is yes, we could produce a lot of this information um, in a more generalized setting, right? We could make witchcraft books um, that are all YouTube videos, or we can make which witchcraft um, information available, just all YouTube videos uh, or all website posts or all podcasts. Um, and I do enjoy uh, doing all of these things. I think doing YouTube videos is great. I think doing podcasts is wonderful. I love writing web posts, right? But there's something about a book that's really, really special um, because it is, it, it slows everything down a little bit. Um, it takes that process of talking about witchcraft and it means that you have to stop and you have to really think about what you're saying. You have to take time, the time to edit it, to revise it, and then to do that, do that again and again and again. Um, you have to double check your facts, double check your information, and then you can put it out there into the world and it will reach people and they will have a chance to kind of ingest it slowly, right? They have a chance to sort of react to it slowly. And you wind up with this kind of slow simmer, right? This kind of bubbling pot of witchcraft. And witchcraft works best uh, on a simmer, I think. I don't think it works as well when it's constantly boiling over. If you've ever read like Stregonona, when the pasta pot boils over and sort of floods the town um, because magic is being used irresponsibly, that's kind of what happens sometimes um, when we are trusting witchcraft, these, um, these fast information sources, uh, social media, um, or even, you know, online content in general. Um, it's not that those are incorrect or bad sources, but that they can be balanced with something that's a little slower, a little more methodical, like a book. Um, I think that's very, very valuable. Um, oftentimes as well, um, the, the books mean that uh, you're dealing with uh, people who are having conversations with each other uh, for extended periods of time. So most books are going to talk about other books that have influenced them. And then there's going to be books that come along and talk about the, the book that you're reading, right? Um, so for example, um, I mentioned Southern Cunning by Aaron Oberon earlier. Aaron and I have had a longstanding um, sort of interaction, uh, you know, through a few different spaces. But this book, they were in part responding to one of the folklore collections that I find really, really valuable and to uh, a chapter, an essay that I had written on some of that folklore collection, which is the, the Silver Bullet by Huber Davies. And so they, they kind of read my response to that and then read the folklore collection and had their own ideas and their own responses and turned it into Southern Cunning, which I then sort of looked at and said, oh, this is really interesting. And that wound up influencing some of what I wrote in my book as well. Uh, Via Hedera's work is, is very similar, uh, where she and I have exchanged a lot of uh, conversations sort of online and, and had these kind of great interactions. But her book is responding to a lot of the same folklore sources that I turn to, say like the Frank Brown collection um, of folklore, where we're both kind of drawing from the same well and sometimes finding very different things and very interesting things that wind up complementing each other across different publications. So if you're wondering why write witchcraft books, um, it's because there's always more to say. There's always more information out there. Um, and you can help be a part of that process of finding that information, and giving your own interpretations and your own ideas. And sometimes that makes a huge difference. Sometimes it's, um, you know, my book might not resonate with somebody, but Via's will, right? Um, or um, uh, Aaron's book might provide a really interesting kind of like entry point for somebody. And they say, I want to know more. And they'll turn to either uh, the silver bullet or they'll turn to New World Witchery and maybe dig a little deeper on some of the things that Aaron starts us, starts us thinking about in their book, right? So that's kind of one of the, the great joys of being able to um, to do a book like this. And crucially, if you have um, experience, if you have knowledge, if you have ideas, you put them out there, uh, particularly if you're somebody, you know, who's a person of color um, from a sort of underrepresented group. Um, a lot of tradition, a lot of, a lot of witchcraft publishing um, has been dominated by people who look and sound like me, right? And so because of that, uh, 
that can make the voices all start to sound a little bit the, the same, right? And, and sort of drown out other voices. We need more voices out there. Um, if you're interested in publishing witchcraft books, if you're interested in knowing more about where to publish, if you have good ideas, reach out to the authors too. I'm always happy to kind of point you towards publishers I think are really good, people who I think are, are, are going to treat you fairly um, and give you some direction on how to make the best possible book that you can write. Uh, all right. So that's, you know, thank you for a great year of sales. Uh, thank you as well for the people who've responded so well to the book. What's coming next? What happens next? Um, I, like I said, I've been off this channel for a little bit. Um, that doesn't mean I haven't been active. I've been incredibly active. I have had a lot going on. I'm doing a lot of things. And uh, I want to make the YouTube a, a more active part of that, but there's there's plenty coming down the road. Uh, I said, you know, why write witchcraft, witchcraft books? Um, I can't seem to stop is kind of my reason, really. I've got a book coming out near the end of this year, which will be, uh, it's either going to be the end of 2022 or the beginning of 2023. Um, it's Llewellyn's complete book of a North American folk magic. I can't remember if they just called it American folk magic or North American folk magic, but I think we went with North American, which is good because I think that's the way to go with it. Um, but Llewellyn's complete book of North American folk magic, which is, uh, I'm just, I'm really the editor for that one. Um, uh, I've written a lot of this sort of stuff that's in it, um, but really the majority of what, what we get here is about two dozen different folk magical practitioners sharing aspects of their traditions and their paths. Um, so we have people talking about um, Southern Conjure. We have people who are talking about Hoodoo. Uh, we have people who are talking about Lukumi. We have people who are talking about uh, American Brujeria. We have people who are talking about Curenderismo. So uh, we've got some uh, Slavic uh, folk magical traditions that show up in a part of the book as well. So we've tried to kind of cover a lot of ground with this and really hear from people who are actually practitioners within those spaces and um, coming at it from a lot of different varieties and a lot of different um, approaches. So hopefully that'll be a really, really good book. I think it, I like it. I think it's really great. Um, I've loved the opportunity to interact with as many great, I was going to say authors, but they're not all necessarily just authors. They're, they're really uh, as many great practitioners as I have. This has been a, a really good opportunity to dig into some of those practices. And I think people are going to find this to be a really valuable source book um, that points people towards kind of regional folk magic in general. So that's coming late 2022, early 2023 from Llewellyn. Um, I also uh, am a co-author on a book with Lane. Uh, we'll be publishing a book. Uh, right now, it's, it's tentative title is Conjuring the Commonplace, uh, a guide to everyday enchantment and junk drawer magic, um, which I know sounds like a long title, uh, but hopefully I'll fit on the cover. Uh, the idea is that it's junk drawer magic. It's the stuff that's already around you, the stuff that's in your house, the stuff that's in your junk drawer, the stuff that's in your front yard. Um, and we're going to talk about the folklore and the folklore history of some of those objects, uh, talk about the ways that the sort of they're used in folk magic. Uh, so for example, like buttons, how are buttons used, right? Um, how are coins used, right? How are uh, toys, including things like broken toys uh, used in folk magic? Um, how could you use a, a broken plate or a broken teacup in folk magic? Um, all that's going to be kind of pulled into this uh, book. This book's going to be coming out from Thousand Volt Press. So it's a smaller press, a um, minority owned press, um, which we're really, really proud to work with. Um, and Lane and I are drafting that book uh, right now. And we're hoping that we'll hit the hit hit the sort of the world of, of the printed page by the end of 2022. That's kind of our target goal. Uh, so be on the lookout for that. We'll be sharing a lot of that on social media as well. I've uh, been doing a lot with um, card divination, cardomancy and things like that lately too. Uh, part of that is that uh, 54 Devils, which is my book on uh, playing card cardomancy, is coming up on its 10th anniversary. It's actually been out for almost 10 years at this point, uh, which means I'm doing a revision on it. And I've been doing kind of some, some heavy revision looking at um, a couple of different things. So uh, one, I'm looking at uh, everything from sort of revising some of the original interpretations to make them a little more expansive, uh, adding some additional sort of nuances of meaning and context, um, talking a little bit about kind of um, what they could mean beyond just sort of the, the strict definition that's sort of in the, the, the chart there. Um, and then also expanding things like um, what if you're reading for like a non-binary client, um, what might be a good card to kind of use for that since the, the system in there um, is built sort of on a sort of dualistic framework initially, but how, there are ways to go and get around that that I've always used that I think belong in the book at this point. Uh, also adding things like spell work, um, how you incorporate cards into spellcraft and spell magic, um, and then how does that also play on the folklore? Do we see evidence of that in the folklore too? So there's going to be a whole lot that we're going to do with that. Um, that uh, revised edition 
working on it um, next year is technically the 10th anniversary. I'm hoping to actually have it out a little before that so it can kind of uh, sort of lead into its 10th anniversary edition at that point. I've got like literally five other nonfiction books that I've got outlines for or that I'm working on proposals for. Uh, plus at least one fiction project as well. There's so much coming uh, down the line for me. I, I don't stop. I just can't stop apparently. Um, I have lots of ideas, always taking notes, always adding stuff to my roster of things that I can, can do. I'm also hoping to do a lot more with the YouTube channel content. Uh, like I said, um, I didn't mean to be away for as long as I was. Have lots of stuff that I want to do, lots of stuff I want to include on this channel. So hopefully you'll stick with me for that. All that is uh, a lot to say kind of in this comeback video, but uh, I did want to just say hi to everybody. Say, I'm sorry, it's been so long since I've been on YouTube with you. Um, there is more coming. Uh, we've done a lot. Uh, I expect to do a lot more as well. Um, and hopefully if you're interested in witchcraft and witchcraft books, this has given you some ideas of kind of how all of that functions too as well. Um, and again, this is also really about kind of the fact that I, I, I want to celebrate this, this book that has now reached, uh, you know, over a year in ages now. Now it's more like a year and three months, right? Uh, it's a 15 month old, right? I wanted to celebrate the fact that this book has done as well as it's done, that I am incredibly grateful to everybody who's helped it do that well, who has helped it become um, the book it has been. Um, and I hope that people will continue to look to it and check it out and, and enjoy it for years to come. But I, I'm so, so thankful for everybody who's you know bought a copy shared a copy uh written a review shared it on social media whatever you've done thank you for that um i think that's going to do it for me for right now uh if you have thoughts on this if you have projects that you'd like to to know more about uh if you want to know about any of the projects that i've mentioned in this video if you have questions about witchcraft and witchcraft publishing i'm happy to answer those as well um and if you uh just want to chat drop a comment. Oh, we like it. If you could, uh, we'd certainly appreciate it if you subscribe. That's always a good thing uh, for us. Uh, if you'll subscribe to the channel uh, and just kind of stick with us, we hope to publish lots of interesting stuff. Some of it's going to be fun and weird and quirky, and some of it's going to be more kind of conversational like this, um, but we've got a lot kind of coming down the line. So looking forward to that. Until next time, thank you so much for watching. Be well. Mm -hmm.